thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you very much to uh, Marianne, Nick, for the organisers, for the opportunity to come and speak in this uh, beautiful city again. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different to what Scott has presented to you. Uh, you I'm afraid you do have a bit of a Scottish double act here this afternoon. Um, and there will be gels, so I'm sorry about that, but um, we'll try and pass over them without too much pain and suffering. Um, so uh, I want to talk today... I'm using that one, um, about uh, ovarian germline stem cells, not so much the somatic cells. These are my disclosures, none of which are of any relevance to what we're going to discuss today. So, so we all learn at our mother's knee that the primordial follicle population is established in fetal life, and this is a beautiful little set of triplets that have just formed over the last few weeks from a, a female fetus of some 17 weeks of gestation. And we all learn that, that that's then an immovable feast, and they will then, some of them will go on and start growing straight away, and, and others will have to hang around till this woman might be 50 before they even start to grow. And of course, many of them will have to try and maintain their chromosomal integrity and develop into a, an oocyte with the potential to turn to a lovely baby um, many decades later. So a tall ask for a germ cell. And this follows what we now uh, have fairly well established as a, a, a developmental pattern going through proliferation of these germ cells. And then, of course, the critical thing is that entry into meiosis. And that starts when the fetus is about 14 weeks of gestation. So then that has to be maintained right through to the LH surge triggers ovulation, which, of course, could be half a century later. So a remarkable ask. So uh, if we're going to try and replicate that in an artificial system, then we've got some challenges to try and do. And once those follicles are formed, we of course have this inevitability. Um, we have this logarithmic uh, decline in follicle number through life, culminating in an insufficiency to keep that steady flow going for FSH to sort of catch and develop on towards ovulation, again, to potentially many, many decades later. And we all know this because this man told us so some 60 years ago. And uh, he was the man who really convinced ovarian biologists back in the uh, 1950s that the ovary was not like, of a mammal, was not like it is in a fly. This is a fruit fly ovariole, which runs a production line of eggs, much like a testis. But he persuaded everyone that the ovary was a very, very different beast in a mammal and in a woman, and it would produce all its eggs all at once, before birth or in early, early postnatal life, if you're a, a mouse or a rat, um, and that was it. And that's really been a remarkable achievement, actually, for that man to have had so much influence on the way we think about ovarian biology. And that was really pretty much unchallenged up until the beginning of this century, when this paper emerged from Joshua Johnson and Jonathan Tilley's lab um, in Harvard, and they started to challenge this concept. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of opprobrium flew from this paper. You know, there was an awful lot of denunciations and, and vitriol poured upon these investigators as a result of that. And to be honest, this paper actually didn't have a huge amount of data to really challenge it, but I think it certainly got the feel thinking that maybe, actually, we ought to do some serious science to try and ch challenge that. And the key thing that they proposed in that paper was that there were cells within the ovary, uh, that you can see on the left-hand panel there, that contained this well-established uh, marker of eggs, of germ cells, MVH, mouse vasal homologue. Um, later I'll be referring to it as DDX4, and that they were proliferating. And of course that should not happen in an adult mammalian ovary. So that's a sort of challenge number one. And actually what happened over the next few years, actually in de degree of obscurity, these papers didn't really perhaps get the publicity that they should have done, was a number of groups in China, and particularly led by Ji Wu in Shanghai, and this is one of her uh, very important papers, demonstrated that you could actually isolate those cells that perhaps Josh Johnson and colleagues had suggested from a mouse ovary, a postnatal one, even from an adult, and you could get these cells, you could make them grow on a feeder layer, um, and this is them in the, again, the top left-hand panel. They term them female germline stem cells, FGSCs. 
and they would proliferate. They showed this BRDU expression. And then when they went on to then uh, characterize the genetic expression of these cells, they had perhaps the characteristics one might ex expect of a fairly undifferentiated primordial germ cell. And they didn't express these markers in the, the lower set of uh, gene names there, which were more markers of established oocytes. So these were not mature oocytes. But in terms of d demonstrating their oogenic potential, the key experiment they did was to inject these cells back into another rodent who'd had uh, busulfan-induced sterility. And then they were able to then go on and demonstrate that these mice returned, regained their fertility and went on and del delivered healthy pups. As you can see here, this is af after labeling the, um, the cells with a GFP marker. And you can see 82% um, of them in these neonatally injected cells produced offspring. And indeed, they went on to demonstrate that that gene was incorporated into the germline and they got F2 uh, animals labeled as well. So, you know, a, a very impressive achievement that didn't get the, 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 the heat and the light that the Tilly papers uh, had done. And that group also went on and did it in the rat as well. And actually, the variation in this experiment, as well as the slightly different rodent model, they used a different marker. So they used Fragilis, which is perhaps an earlier marker of germ cells. But again, they went on and did really much the same of labeling these cells, injecting them into chemotherapy sterilized animals, and demonstrating that you could get labeled pups as a result. So that was starting to become a bit of a body of evidence. But what, again, really um, hit the headlines was this paper, again from Jonathan Tilley, suggesting uh, a number of things. And the title is indeed actually quite contentious just by itself. So he's suggesting that there were, he could make oocytes, not just germline stem cells, but actual oocytes. Um, and they, these had come from mitotic germ cells, and they'd come from women, not rodents. So a number of pretty contentious claims just in the title um, of his paper. And what he did, uh, did is actually very similar to what Ji Wu and colleagues had done in, in the rodents of isolate cells, this time using fax rather than other magnetic um, preparations, uh, isolated them um, using a DDX4 antibody, uh, grew them on feeder layers, and then they showed sort of similar expression of early markers to what Ji Wu had seen, not identical but pretty comparable. And he showed that when you put them back in an ovary, you could then get oocytes from them. And this was rodent work. This is not the human work. But it actually, he didn't have any live births of rodents um, in this publication. But what he did have was suggestions that actually you could find these in women as well. So these were adult women, um, oophorectomy specimens. And in this, he could demonstrate that actually when you grew them, Sometimes in the culture, little cells popped off from the feeder layer, small round cells that he started to wonder might actually be some sort of oocytes. And that's what he labels here as oocytes in this column here of this gene expression panel. And they showed some other uh, immunos immunocytochemical um, cell uh, markers of, of germ cells. And indeed, a suggestion, and I think a a perhaps quite a weak one, that these might be expressing meiotic markers as well. And that, that, of course, is the clincher, you know, because the definition really of, well, one of the definitions or requirements of an oocyte is that it's gone through meiosis, and you really want to see those chromosomal spreads to be convinced of that. And that's actually something we have still not seen in any of these studies. So that caused a huge amount of uh, activity. A lot of people started publishing papers saying this was rubbish, and there remain an awful lot of people in the field who think that these cells are essentially are a fiction and have been unable to isolate them. But we thought we'd try and do that ourselves, and with my uh, great friend and colleague Evelyn Telfer, we established a program of work in our laboratories to do this, and this is some of the work that uh, a clinical research fellow, Cheryl Dunlop, went on to produce. And actually, I must say, it was after an awful lot of work, an awful lot of changes to the, public, to the protocol that Tilly had published. So we, although we based it on his work, it actually had developed a quite a long way because what he published, we absolutely could not get to work. So we had to do quite a lot of changes to it. But what Cheryl was able to demonstrate was from 
postnatal, these are adult female biopsies of ovary, you could isolate some cells that if you were patient enough and grew up for long enough, because they took a long time, you could get cells that had the same sort of genetic um, markers as these other groups that established uh, in the rodent and indeed in the human. And you can see here, this on that left-hand column, these are what we are termed ovarian stem cells, expressing these genes similar to what you would see in a fetal ovary as a sort of positive control. And uh, Cheryl went on to characterize these. Um, these, as you might ex ex uh, hope or perhaps expect, showed some of these stem cell markers, and they showed some of these very established gene germline markers, and we managed to do it in uh, cow ovaries as well as humans. But these were all after culture, and actually there's been a lot of debate about how much actually just culture in these cells for quite long periods of time might actually cause various changes to go on that means they're not quite the cells that you started on. And others were also starting to publish a little bit of work on this. This is some unpublished data, actually, by Erin Wolfe, who tried to do this in a monkey, um, which is a, and to try and get as far as IVF. Um, and I think it's, this is actually remains unpublished a number of years later. Um, but what she was able to do was to do a very similar type of protocol, label these cells after extracting them, inject them back in to a monkey ovary, and then try and do IVF. So stimulate the ovary, recover some eggs, and see if they were labeled with the green marker, and then perhaps try and fertilize them. And she was able to show that some of the eggs uh, did actually um, fluoresce green. They did seem to have incorporated this marker. Of course, not all of them, because this is not a sterilized animal. So you're just putting them in amongst the existing population of follicles. But she did show this, but I, I'm afraid I think it remains unpublished as yet. But over the course of uh, following up that work that I showed you from Cheryl Dunlop in our own laboratory, um, we've gone on and try and refine this protocol. And this is a paper that was just published just a, a couple of months ago now um, with work led by Yvonne Clarkson, a postdoc in Evelyn's lab, trying to characterize these a, a bit more robustly and building in, as I'll show you, using um, aldehyde dehydrogenase, which is a, a marker used in stem cell biology, to try and tidy it up a bit and get a bit more information. So what we were able to do using uh, a refinement of this same fax method that has been used by a number of other groups, and this is, it is difficult stuff, this, is to isolate cells. And perhaps one of the most difficult parts of the whole experiment, actually, is turning a tough bit of adult ovary into a single cell suspension. And that is actually one of the major challenges of the whole thing. But what you can do, and this is using, sorry, go back one, this uh, using two different antibodies, um, because one of the controversies has been over whether this is an, an, an appropriate antibody to use, the, the original um, ABCAM antibody in the top there, you can get very or comparably, uh, comparable patterns of sorted cells, which you can see in the green panels there, do then um, express DDX4 that you can label them fluorescently, and the negative population didn't. And we went on to characterize them, and now we can, with this refinement, get enough cells that you can start analyzing them straight off the fax machine rather than having to culture them for weeks and weeks and risk these in vitro um, differentiation issues. So here's a demonstration on lanes uh, C and D, uh, are the ones, so C, D, and E are the ones to look at. So C is the positive control. D is the sorted positive cells showing expression of these markers. This is the gene level, and E is the negative control. And the other panels, or the other lanes are similar, but using artificially transfected um, uh, hex cells. And then actually we can also show this at the protein level. Again, the panels are the same. So again, you're seeing some evidence that these cells do express DDX4 straight off the fax machine as they ought to when they've been sorted on that basis, uh, and the negatives ones don't. So we can refine this also by double uh, sorting with aldeflor, uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase. And actually, this is, again, uh, these, a lot of these studies, uh, these data that I'm showing you, are very preliminary. Um, but we wanted to get this out there and actually start to see what else people could do to try and substantiate this. And when you do this, you start to think, well, actually, perhaps there's more than one population of these cells in the tissue. Perhaps in, we, we thought we could identify three separate populations. 
And that perhaps makes some sense, because you know, if these cells are there in the ovary, you wouldn't expect them to all be identical. They're going to, some of them, if they are actually doing what they might do, are going to be starting to grow. They're going to be starting to differentiate, perhaps, some of them. So they're going to have different sizes and different gene patterns. And indeed, they did have different sizes. And uh, this is sort of a panel of characterization of their expression. And you can start to see some differences between their, um, their markers. Most of them are identical. But you can perhaps, uh, if you look carefully, you can see that there's one group here, the P2 group, um, that don't have this particular 3' prime DDX expression. So perhaps there's some splice variants going on there. And there's also this one group um, that, also, that don't have Dazzle expression, which is another absolute classic germ cell marker. So there is variation there, and perhaps this does reflect, as I say, differences in their pattern of development, and of course that's something that they have to do um, endogenously. Uh, and maybe the expression of Dazzle is thought to be related to perhaps the onset of meiosis, so perhaps that might come and go a bit in some of these cells, and then of course they have to go on and associate with, follic with cells to become, become follicles. So, of course, that's the million-dollar question, is what actually can these cells do? And again, as I say, I emphasize this is very preliminary data that we published in this paper, but I think we're starting to see just the suggestion that they might be able to do something. Uh, and and we, what we wanted to do was think of a model well, how can you demonstrate that these human cells can form follicles? So what we thought was perhaps the best somatic cells to put them with would be fetal somatic cells from the fetal ovary, because those are the cells that are naturally about to form follicles, so there's perhaps something about them that will encourage that. Uh, and so we developed some, some lines of these um, where the germ cells have been removed, and indeed in very prolonged culture, they never express any germ cell markers, so they do seem to be a fairly pure line. And we mix them together in, in a uh, just, you know, put a bunch of them together with some of these um, putative ovarian stem cells and cultured them for a period of time. And perhaps sometimes you can start to see some changes going on in how these cells interact with each other and how they associate with each other that might, with the eye of faith, be taken as perhaps the beginnings of follicular genesis. And that's what you can see in the insets, uh, just a slightly higher power image of the uh, lower power in the background. And that right-hand image is the negative control where you don't see these things. And, and they happened actually not too terribly infrequently. Actually, more than half of these aggregates found, were found to have some sort of association like that. And you can see in the, the middle, well, the, the first second from the, on the left, you can see there's a very eosinophilic cell, perhaps uh, as you might see in an oocyte. And you can, by using uh, DDX4 immunohistochemistry, you can see that the cells that you put in, they remain present, you can still see them. And very occasionally, you also started to see things like this, which is, I think, a pretty remarkable structure that was exuded um, from the exudate. And if you look at it under higher power and stain it, and this is, again, as you can imagine, very challenging and fiddly to do, you can see that that structure has within it actually a number of DDX4 positive cells surrounded by DDX4 negative cells. So it's certainly not a follicle. It has, certainly hasn't got a conventional single oocyte within it, but maybe there is something going on that these cells, the, these are being uh, surrounded and associated with these somatic cells. So again, very preliminary data, perhaps as a point that these cells are starting to do something in these short-term cultures. In another sort of approach to this, we've also explored it in the uh, bovine model. Um, this is uh, work of a PhD student, Kelsey Grieve, in our laboratory, who um, carried on the, the original work I showed you where she ident uh, was able to extract these bovine ovarian stem cells. And then working with Susanna Williams in Oxford, um, she's got a model where you can mix the cells together with ovarian somatic cells, and then you put them under a kidney capsule in a mouse, which is a classic developmental paradigm, and then you can culture them actually for quite a long period of time and see what happens. And if you do that with putting mouse germ cells back with mouse somatic cells, you get things that look very like reconstituted ovaries with follicles growing and they all look, uh, they all look great.
So what Kelsey was, did with these bovine somatic cells is actually after a few weeks in the, the, um, in the kidney capsule, you did actually see things that look very like follicles. And that on the top left there, this is one of these chimeric um, reaggregates. You can see uh, just with the light microscopy, there's something going on there. And then the histology at the bottom is showing that these do look remarkably like um, growing follicles. And then the negative control up on the top right there. And then, although we haven't been able to identify that these are definitely bovine cells in the middle, um, they are certainly size-wise very distinct from what a mouse oocyte would be if you'd re-aggregated it. They're not quite as, um, quite as big as a normal bovine ovary, uh, and maybe that's an interesting analysis in itself, but there certainly seems to be some evidence that these can associate and form follicles in this particular model. The final piece of work I want to talk to you today is again goes back to a, 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 some work that Jonathan Tilley has published, and again, contentious work because he's now uh, published this is now a, a year ago, um, claiming that these cells can actually contribute physiologically, because that's been one of the real um, nitty-gritty questions about these cells. That even if you can extract them and do things with them in the lab, what are they actually doing in their physiological state? Are they actually contributing to normal follicular genesis? And in this paper, he's starting to produce some suggestions or some arguments that actually perhaps they are contributing to normal follicular genesis in, uh, in a rodent model. And so one of the ways he's done that is by um, linking, making, as you, these are all genetic constructs. So in this particular one, he's linked the, the gene strarate, stimulated by retinoic acidate, which is a key um, gene that turns on is related to the onset of meiosis. And he's linked that to a suicide gene. So this is a herpes simplex thymidine kinase. So when this gets activated, it converts the drug, the, uh, the, uh, this drug, uh, gancyclovir, and that will kill the cell. So any cell that expresses uh, STRAR8 will turn on this enzyme, and if you then also treat the animal with this drug, you will kill those cells. That's the theory. So you can then for give the drug, and you can take the drug away, uh, allowing recovery. So he did this to some animals, to some mice, and you can see here the total number of primordial germ cells within an ovary, and how it seems to decline during a course of a few days of treatment with this drug. So that means that the cell, the follicle population should be maintained over that very short period of time, but actually it's not. The number of germ cells, the number of primordial follicles is falling rapidly, implying there's some normally some new generation. And then when you stop the drug, and you can see in the green panels, you can see some recovery, that the follicle population is being replenished after you've stopped any, the theory being any meiotic cells, um, allow them to start going through meiosis again and forming follicles. And you can see here um, some evidence that um, um, SYCP3, a classic marker of meiosis, the amount of expression of that goes up after you withdraw the drug, and likewise the number of cells stained for this particular meiotic marker goes up after you remove the drug. So perhaps some evidence that this causes a temporary blockage in the pipeline of new follicles being formed would be the, would be the argument. He also did another intriguing experiment, um, the same sort of model, but looking at this in different ages. Yeah? So on the left, we have young animals, young but, but sort of reproductively mature. Again, a period of time of treatment with the drug in the red, and then a recovery period in the green. And you can see that the number of follicles goes down quite sharply with the drug, but then recovers back up. And they calculated about nearly 1,600 new follicles were made over this period of time. In the more middle-aged animals, shall we say, in the middle panel, a decline and then a recovery. And the number of follicles has gone down a bit, you can see on the axis, from about 3,000 down to about 2,000. So a, a number of uh, follicles formed. Actually, there's no significant difference between the, the orange and the green, but you know, it, it's, a, it's a bit of an increase, perhaps. But when they did it into more late reproductive aged animals, and you can see how these animals now have only got about 300 follicles to start with, rather than 3,000 in the younger animals, that actually there was no change. 
There was no, well, there was no change in number. So they found no evidence that there was uh, a, 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 a loss of new follicle formation and conversely recovery thereafter. Although, the, going back to the gene expression analysis again, which is perhaps uh, more sensitive, they did find a fall uh, in the, this meiotic marker with this drug. So this would suggest that actually one of the reasons why um, things that don't carry on and the menopause occurs is not that these cells aren't there, but they don't work anymore. They can't produce them. But when they try to isolate these cells, they are still there in these older animals, but they're just not producing new follicles. So that's perhaps not the lack of the cells themselves, but the environment in which they're in, the niche in, in these older, older ovaries is preventing this. Final experiment he showed us in that paper, actually, is whether they can then contribute to actually live births rather than just making follicles. And this, is, again, is a, a, a labeling experiment using here uh, in the top left-hand panel, you can see some YFP, which has been switched on um, by this same so Cree recombinase type model. And you can see the two green cells are a putative new oocytes, and the arrowheads, um, which you can see are mar uh, marking uh, cells in the other panels uh, in color, are ones that are already there to start with. But they're not labeled by the YFP, because they're not, they were existing ones. And then in the bottom panels, you can see how these then are uh, labeling follicles that carry on growing, and indeed, they went on to produce labeled offspring um, from these follicles. So these are indeed sort of challenging and intriguing experiments in this paper, and of course, we really need other people to replicate them, ideally using different approaches, because one of the issues with these sort of very clever genetic recombination experiments is sometimes they don't necessarily always go quite exactly as the theory would have you believe, and so it will be nice, I think, to see this replicated. So this is also, I think it's important to think, part of a broader picture of how people are going about making artificial gametes, uh, both male and female. Um, and this is actually just this one little bit in the middle that we're talking about. And actually, otherwise, there are all sorts of methods from stem cells that people are also getting to work fairly robustly now. And indeed, I just wanted to mention a really extraordinary piece of work um, that, that uh, was published from Japan a year or so ago um, from Saito and Hayashi's group, where they were able to completely recapitulate human oogenesis and uh, rodent oogenesis and fertility in vitro, starting from stem cells, turning them through um, by, well, into induced um, primordial germ cell-like cells, mixing them with somatic cells um, to making artificial ovaries. They then associated, formed follicles, this period of um, in vitro differentiation you see on the top right, where the cells mature, change their expression patterns, then in vitro growth of the follicles, and then uh, obtaining large numbers of apparently normal-sized and healthy-looking M2 eggs. And you can see that amazing picture down at the bottom there of this whole dish of lovely-looking mature M2 eggs that had come from stem cells. And indeed, they were able to fertilize these and generate live births. And indeed, those animals, the pups, went on to become fertile adults as well. So, I mean, this is a truly astonishing achievement to be able to do this. And of course, the, the, the key will be to whether people can replicate this in, in larger mammals and, of course, in due course, in humans, um, one day perhaps for therapy, but certainly as a, an excellent model for um, oogenesis. So what does all this mean? Where do we stand in interpreting all this? Well, I mean, you know, nowhere to say more clearly that, of course, the menopause still happens. The IMS is not going to go out of business anytime soon. Um, you know, but I think uh, there is now a, a growing body of evidence that there are some interesting cells in the ovary that can be extracted, isolated, grown up. They do have some intriguing characteristics. Um, if we take, take it as, um, you know, believe that they extrapolate the data a bit. Perhaps what can they do to the ovary? This is very interesting. Can they restore that? And of course, this is also, from a biological perspective, a really interesting model of how you can actually study human oogenesis. Because we have almost no data on how, for example, meiosis works in the human. All the data largely, almost all the data, refers to rodent models where it is actually different because you just can't get human eggs to do this in. At the moment, barring that Tilly data, we don't have any evidence that if they are there, that they really contribute to normal function of the ovary. And I, I left that no evidence in, in bold because I think we really need to see some confirmation of this before we really want to change, change this.
And there remain a lot of key issues. There remain a lot of people who are profoundly skeptical of this whole field. It's difficult to isolate these cells, and that needs to be reproduced by more groups. We need better ways of doing it. Perhaps DDX4 uh, has a, is a bit of a poison chalice. Uh, and we need to be able to demonstrate robustly that these cells can go into meiosis, because that has really not been clearly demonstrated uh, as yet. And of course, what they interact with is that the niche is, of course, the buzzword, and that's what really determines how they're going to mature and go on. So what can we do with them clinically? Well, can they be activated? Um, you can imagine um, you, 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 this would rather undermine um, Scott's scenario of predicting the menopause. If you could suddenly turn the clock back all those years with um, some fancy injections or therapies that cause these things to come to life. Um, fertility at any age, goodness, that would be a bit of a challenge for all of us. Um, but perhaps more realistically in the foreseeable for women who are going to have their fertility compromised either genetically through POI or through through some chemotherapeutic insult, then that might be a, a, a something that society would certainly find easier to deal with in the shorter term. So uh, I hope that's not been too much of a uh, jail challenge. Um, I'd like to just thank particularly Evelyn for uh, her uh, collaboration and friendship over these years. Uh, there's a list of the people who actually did all the hard work in the lab uh, and our funders, uh, the Medical Research Council, for all this work. And thank you for your attention.